Go ahead. I, I'm going to start a few preliminary things. Um, we have to do kind of announce each time uh, that the meeting is being recorded. Um, by participating in the meeting, um, you're consenting to being recorded and the recordings will be posted on the task force website. Um, we're just going to remind everybody to please mute your microphone when you're not talking so we can hear the judge clearly. Um, upcoming meetings are listed on the task force website and uh, task force members and presenters will be receiving calendar invitations and contact Leah if there's any trouble with that. And there'll be some time for task force members to have some questions uh, and discussion at the end of this, although we were at a brisk pace yesterday. Um, to facilitate that, please just put questions in the chat as they arise. Um, we'll try and have a little more dialogue. Yesterday we had, uh, Judge Morrissey, we had five speakers, which was a very brisk pace. So I ended up aggregating and asking the questions. We may be able to let some of our task force members unmute and ask you directly, but we'll see how the time goes with that. And I just wanted to say that we've asked Chief Judge Morrissey to provide the task force with information about a number of things, the state of evictions, the data being collected by the court, the challenges in managing eviction filings, how tenants are currently accessing resources, both legal and non-legal, what are the steps the court's been taking to meet some of the initial requirements of HB 18, uh, including the notice of intent, any training or instructions or to court judges or clerks and litigants, and the planning the judiciary is doing um, for implementation of the Access to Counsel program, uh, including identifying needed resources. You know, we want to be your ally in, in helping to um, recognize that this is a lift. This is a change and a lift um, for everyone, a, a positive change, but one that will still require some additional resources. So with that, and without further ado, so we can get to Chief Judge Morrissey, we're honored and privileged to have you with us today uh, to give us insights about how the judiciary is approaching this Access to Counsel initiative and, um, and uh, address some of the things we just talked about. So thank you so much, Judge, for being here, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Professor. I'm going to share my screen and, and good morning to everyone. And it's a uh, um, thank you invite, for inviting me to present. I'm trying to. A reminder if folks could mute um, their microphones, except for the judge, uh, while uh, the presentation is occurring. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I'm having a tough time with my. Um, we can, we can, can you see, see your presentation. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, we see that the front page. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if if I click this can did I just change a page? Can you see that? No, it's still the Mine's title page. Dark on my screen, unfortunately. Um, Chief Judge Morsi, I can advance it. If I click on at the bottom of the Teams window, I can see one of fourteen. And if I click the arrow button, I can advance it. If you can't. Right, I just can't. My screen is blank where the presentation should be for some reason. Um, oh, well, I think each one of us actually, um, to your point, Pam, can move the presentation yeah. along with okay. those guide buttons. Yeah, I so think if we you, can. you know, we Let can do try, like I'll in the old the, days where they had the beep. To, <laughs> I'll try the version the on my. Uh, on, I have it up on my computer screen, independent from from the the Teams meeting that we're in. So. Um, good morning again. This is the what I thought I'd first do is just go over what the statistics that we have right now and to try to show the current trends that I believe are happening and try to explain at least to the extent that I can as to why they're happening in the manner that they're happening. So if you'll go to that uh, slide number two, Pam. If you can see, I have fiscal year data um, from 19, 20, 21, and 22. So you have to think fiscal year. Fiscal year 21 ended at the end of June. So starting in July and August, um, that's fiscal 22. 
and you can see from July's data that we had um, 40,172 failure to pay rent filings. Historically, we averaged between 55,000 to 60,000 failure to pay rent filings prior to the pandemic. So the the we're, we're off about um, 30% or so from pre-pandemic filings in July, and that number went down um, to 32,978 in August. Um, you can see in prior months in the gray shaded area, prior months, it was averaging right around 30,000 for the months that we were back up. You have to, you have to, it kind of flows with the way that we were doing business at the time in reaction to the, um, to the pandemic. So if you look back to July uh, of in fiscal year 21, that was July of 2020. Um, we only had 8,205 um, failure to pay rent filings, and that's because the CARES Act was in full effect, and we really weren't processing any landlord-tenant cases. We were down to our core functions at that point of domestic violence cases, bail reviews, re-reviews, and those type of things. Um, we started to move to another phase in August of 2020, and then by September, we were back to handling landlord-tenant actions. And it pretty much stayed consistent through the next months. It started to go down again because in January and February, we had to retrench really starting in November. We started to retrench because of the spike in the pandemic during that period of times. And then we came back out and in the middle of March, we were back up to what we consider phase five, which is fully operational, albeit still subject to the imposition of social distancing um mask mandates in the courthouse and all the other uh things that we've done to limit the spread of the pandemic in our in our courthouses um, and that stayed pretty consistent ever since and if you just go to, to slide three please pam you can just kind of see a uh, a linear sign on that in, in the filings um and if you'll go to slide four so these are warrants of restitution i'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the process of of landlord tenant in maryland so i'll just briefly give you an overview of that that the case the overwhelming majority of cases that are filed in maryland are failure to pay rent cases um, there are other cases and i'll get to those in just a minute but by number and by volume it's it's overwhelmingly failure to pay rent i'd say you know 97 98 percent of the cases fall into that category and it, it, it's a pretty simple issue that's before the court. Is their rent due and owing or not? Um, individuals have certain defenses in that. They can file what we call a blue file, which is a uh, escrow account if there are, are um, problems with the file. And then that kind of gets separated out from the routine failure to pay rent cases. Um, when the matter comes to, to issue, it's uh, by law, it's supposed to be set in within seven days of hearing. Even pre-pandemic, that was the exception rather than the rule. It, because of the volume of these cases that are filed, it was rare that we could get um, from, from the minute it was filed to a hearing seven days later. It typically ranged between seven to 21 days across the state as to when that first hearing would be set in. If the landlord is successful at that stage, and um, about a third of the cases are dismissed before they even hit the courtroom um, because people have paid typically. They, they um, perhaps the landlord filed on the 5th and, um, you know, they've paid on the 10th. And by the time they come to the court on the 15th, they're, the court lacks jurisdiction once the amount um, has, once the amount has been paid, there's no further jurisdiction of the court. These are in rem proceedings, which means they're for the property and typically not for a money judgment. Um, and that's kind of a hard concept for a lot of people to understand because if I do grant judgment in favor of the landlord, I'm very careful to say um, I grant judgment in favor of the landlord for possession of the property. Um, and I say that on purpose because it's not a money judgment that they can garnish wages for or things like that. It is a amount that's determined by the court to be due in order for the individual to pay off um, the landlord and stay in the property. Uh, if the landlord is successful at the at the trial level when it first comes to hearing, then a judgment would be entered again for possession in a dollar amount. Let's just say three thousand uh, dollars. 
the landlord then has to wait four business days before they can take the next step and that's to file a warrant of restitution and that coincides with the four-day appeal period that individuals have for these failure to pay rent cases if the landlord does file the warrant of restitution and again about another third of the cases never make it to the warrant of restitution stage. The, the landlord may have a judgment, but again, that judgment may be paid off or perhaps the tenant moved or something happened that they did not require to file that warrant of restitution. Um, it, it, so, so if there were 60,000 original ferry to pay rents, only 40,000 of them um, make it to, to court and then only 20,000 of them typically have a warrant of restitution filed on them. Um, and then the, the judge typically will, will examine the warrant of restitution that's filed, compare it to the judgment that's been entered, and if everything lines up, they will, they will execute the warrant of restitution. And that warrant of restitution then goes over to the Sheriff's Department, and then it's up to the Sheriff's Department, or in Baltimore County, it's constables, but that's the only one that has constables in the state. Um, then the sheriffs at whatever determined, however they do it, is up to the sheriffs as to when they go out and they execute on the the uh, warrant of restitution and evict the individual. Um, so you can see the warrant of restitutions. Um, let me just click over here. Are we on that? That I'm on slide four, Pam. Thank you. Uh, yep, yep. Okay, yep, great. Yep. Um, the warrants of restitution have been, you know, fractional compared to what they had been prior to the uh, pandemic. You can see in some months, like in January of um 2020 it, there was 26,000 warrants of restitution filed um we've been averaging since we're kind of back up um to uh warrant to, to full operations again albeit we're social distancing imposed so our dockets aren't what they used to be prior to the pandemic um that we're at about an average of 4,000 warrants of restitution after that now again those don't all result in evictions um, because individuals that can either move or they can pay the rent that's due. If you'll go to slide five, that's just a, um, again, a graphic depiction of, of what that other data chart showed just a moment ago. And if you'll go to slide six, so the evictions, if you um, start to look at, they've been, you know, there was one month in June uh, of uh, this past year of 2021 that it was 945, but for July and August, there are 772 and 793, and that's about a. They're averaging about 40% uh, of what they used to be prior to the pandemic. So if you go to slide seven, that's again just a, a linear chart of the same thing that we're seeing over time. If you go to slide eight, you can see that um, in fiscal 20, so that includes March, April, and May and June of uh, of 2020. And that's when, in you know, on March 13th, the, the whole world changed for me, um, and I think everybody else in the whole world. And uh, a few days prior to March 13th, we had invited the Secretary of Health, who was um, came to our Judicial Council and briefed us on what was going to happen. And um, he basically told us to panic. <laughs> he said it much more eloquently than that, but it was clear by the end of the meeting with the Secretary that a significant event was occurring and that we needed to react. And um, through the guidance of then Chief, the Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, Chief Judge Barbera, we kind of immersed ourselves in a conference room for the next several weeks and started, she started issuing a set of orders to guide the, not only the judiciary, but all the users of the judiciary and how we were gonna handle this. And so in those first months, if you remember, there was the lockdown in April and, and uh, we really went down to, um, we never closed. And I'm very proud of the fact that we never closed because uh, we recognized immediately that we had to handle um, victims of domestic violence and we had to handle people that were getting incarcerated because people were still getting arrested during this period of time. And we had a new flavor of cases that were coming in that were um, individuals that were um, refusing to be quarantined in, in cases like that. So we had to deal with those type of cases. And it really dramatically affected landlord tenant in the sense that we were, we were not processing landlord tenant cases at all whatsoever. We were accepting them, but we weren't doing anything with them and we were, weren't running any dockets. We, we weren't running any civil dockets at all at that period of time, let alone landlord tenant. Um, and then you can see because of the changes that were made to operations during fiscal 2021. So from June of, I'm sorry, July of 2020 
through June of 2021, the number of evictions went down dramatically as the result of of the the business processes that we intentionally put into place as the result of the pandemic. And then you can see that um, it, it's it's trending to, to be flat right now, in my opinion, um, moving forward. I, I don't have September's data yet, but I'll have it in the next week to 10 days. Um, Breach of lease. These are the other case types besides failure to pay rent that can be filed and breach of leases are up. However, all of our judges are very cognizant of the fact that we will not allow someone to disguise a failure to pay rent case as a breach of lease. There has to be a substantial breach, breach in order to um, proceed on these cases. And, and there were many, many times I'm originally from Prince George's County and I've handled hundreds of thousands of landlord tenant cases and um, I was very careful to make sure that that they weren't trying to disguise a failure to pay rent case. And there were many times where I just told the person, I'm sorry, you have to go back and file a failure to pay rent case. Um, and you can see these are up. Um, but again, the numbers where if you look in August, there was 228 breach of lease filings compared to 40,000 failure to pay rent filings. If you could go to slide number 10, Pam. Thank you. So a third category of cases are tenant holding over, and that's where the lease term has expired. Uh, and regardless of whether the person's paid their rent or not, the landlord moves to retake possession of the property. And those have, have been up significantly um, over time over, since the pandemic, and particularly the last several months, um, really since we started processing cases again back in March at, at full operations. Um, I would just note, though, again, it's, you know, 618 tenant holding over cases compared to 40,000 failure to pay rank filings. And then wrongful detainer, and, and I think wrongful detainer is not affected by the pandemic in any sense. It's, um, it's a case where the person that's in possession of the property or that's act, not in possession, but in the property has no legal right to be in the property. They have no landlord tenant relationship. It's typically involves family members, perhaps a adult child that was residing in the house that the parents no longer want, or perhaps as the result of a uh, of a relationship that has has terminated and one person is there but isn't the leaseholder to the property but is remaining on the property. And I don't think that really had had has has changed very much in in reflection to um, the pandemic. It, it's a unique subset of cases that occur and um, they're really more family related matters typically. Um, some of the actions that we've taken, if you could go to slide 12, um, this is just one of the, the numerous things that we've done in the judiciary to try to inform our users that there is money um, out there and available to pay rent. Um, we've incorporated the QR code. I'm very, I, I love the QR codes. Um, uh, it's, it's come a long way. They've been around for a long time, but when I, when someone told me that I could use my, my phone's photo, uh, feature to use these, it opened a new world for me. And we've incorporated those into all of our advertising and our, our forms. There'll, there'll be QR codes coming forward on it. Every time I do a revision, we'll have a QR code. And as you can see, this, this is a sandwich board that's in the entrance way of this particular courthouse. And I think I'm, I was in Harford County at the time, although I, you can't hold me to that. Um, excuse me, my lights just went out because I haven't moved enough. Let me change the light here. I, there you go. Oh. These are the... These are the team's incidents, right? I apologize about that. Um, these are in the, the front of every courthouse and in the clerk's office in every courthouse. Um, and you can see it not only uh, um, will we'll give you direct access to the Maryland Emergency Rental Assistance Center, but it also drives individuals to our uh, Maryland Court Help Centers. And I'm very proud of the work that the help centers have done. Um, just to give you an idea, since the March of 2020, when this all started, um, through August of this last year, the, the help centers have handled over 100,000 individuals and have um, 33,000 of those are related to landlord tenant issues. In August of this past year, the um, walk-in centers, which are now operational again because we're open in the courthouses, have fielded over 900 um, individuals in those and we have 
help walk in help centers in Upper Marlboro, Baltimore City, Rockville. We just opened during the middle of the pandemic in July of this last year. We're going to have a grand opening in December if every if the conditions permit. And I'd, I'd like to invite all of you to come to that. Um, we have uh, the original office was in Glen Burnie. We have one in Salisbury and then we have um, two kind of part times. And it's an experiment that we've been doing in Hagerstown and in Cambridge. They, they don't really have the volume that would dictate a live walk-in center because they may only do um, civil type cases or landlord type cases once every two weeks or so. So we send someone to, to, to Cambridge from Salisbury one day a week and we do the same thing with Cambridge. Um, and then we opened our Catonsville um, also during the middle of the pandemic in March of last year. Uh, in August alone, the, the walk-in centers did 900 calls, and then we have the telephone, chat, and email center that's here near me in Annapolis. And on any given day, we have over 25 legal aid attorneys. It's a subsidiary of legal aid, um, and they're the same group in the walk-in centers in person. Um, they provide brief legal advice to individuals, and so they helped over 2,800 2, individuals just on landlord-tenant related issues alone in August. Um, the sandwich boards that I talked about are, have been very helpful, and I think we're getting a lot of hits off of them and driving traffic to the help center and to the emergency rental relief individuals. Very early on in the, I believe it was in July of 2020, I sent the letter to every county executive in the state and, um, and the mayor of Baltimore City requesting contact information, because if you remember, money was available back in through the CARES Act as early as July of 2020. And so I asked them to reach out to, and Pam Ortiz, who's been helping me with these slides, that one of the individuals from her department has been coordinating this effort to make sure that we know in the help centers where the money is and how to connect the people to the money and how to assist the individuals to fill out those forms so that we can expedite the process for sending out this money. Um, on any number of occasions we've been required to amend or actually create new forms as the result of actions that have occurred on both the federal and the state levels. Um, we had to create a new form for the CARES Act and what I'll get to in just a minute under House Bill 18 is the 10 day notice form that we've created. Um, we've updated our websites multiple, multiple times. Again, thanks to Pam Ortiz and her group. Um, we've actually developed a subset for just COVID related landlord tenant issues. I have um, I have issued 19 communications that I, I don't do administrative orders because those would direct only the court. So I prefer to do communications to indicate to the bar and to the public and to the court how we're modifying operations as a result of the CARES Act, as a result of the CDC agency order. If you can remember, there were there, HUD got involved at one point. HUD's back involved again. I just saw a notice of. Uh, of proposed regulations or emergency regulations on HUD related um, things. And we'll take a look at that and I'll, I'll most likely have to communicate again out to the bar and to the public as to how we're going to react to that. Um, the, um, we, I also meet regularly with Secretary Holt, who's the Secretary of Housing and, um, and we um, try to coordinate our efforts as best we can to make sure that we're driving business to his office and to the locals who have the money. Uh, he indicated to me that I just had a conversation with him either at the beginning, the weeks kind of blend together as I'm sure you can all appreciate. I think it was either at the beginning of this week or the end of last week. And he said that they would have distributed $147 million of the funds that we had that we have um, by October 1st, uh, and so he was very happy that that's accelerating and then money is getting out to the street. Um, there were, as the result of the CDC agency orders, um, the, they, they were labeled nationally as moratoriums, both Governor Hogan's order and the CDC order. And unfortunately, that was a misnomer because they were not moratoriums in the sense that they prohibited the filing of actions. What they prohibited were evictions. Um, and so we had to allow people to continue to file and we allowed them to come to court and basically they were affirmative defenses that tenants needed to, um, to prove to the court in order for the court to act on that. And we think, I don't have an exact number for that, um, 
but there was about 5,000 of these cases that came in. And what we did is rather than entering judgment, we reserved judgment. So we would have the hearing, determine the amount was due, recognize that the tenant had successfully asserted the, um, the defense, and then we would mark those as reserved judgments. And we held them until such time as the CDC agency order expired um, and the governor's order expired. And then we would enroll those judgments. I added an additional step in the process. If you remember me telling you that it's a two-step process in ferry to pay rent cases, um, once those judgments were enrolled, um, the, the landlord still needed to uh, file a warrant of restitution in order to move the process forward. I was concerned because some of these reserve judgments could go back as long as July of, of 2020, and that's, um, it, 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 they, there were so many things that happen when like the CDC does things um, and it, it's really a disservice that a federal agency would try to override the state system because they don't un each state system is different obviously and it creates all sorts of machinations that they had never contemplated I'm sure and perhaps didn't care whether they caused those issues or not um, but typically a, a judgment in Maryland not typically by law it only lasts for 60 days. If you do not file a warrant of restitution within that 60 day period, that judgment expires and, and no eviction can occur as a result of that. Um, so all of these, because the CDC did what they did, it altered that process. So now we're, we're having judgments that could have, you know, be effective back to July of 2020. So I added an additional step on those reserve judgments to require that any time a warrant of restitution was filed on those reserve judgments, those cases would be set for hearing 21 days out just to determine whether or not the landlord still had a valid case and still had monies that were due and owing and the individual was still in possession of the property and they still needed an eviction. So those are occurring as we speak right now. Um, we don't know. I, I don't know how many of those warrants or how many of the reserve judgments will actually result in a um, in a warrant being filed because of the time lapse on these things. The landlord tenant process is usually a monthly type thing where you either pay your rent or you don't and you either catch up or you don't. And it's usually within a 30 to 45 to 60 day time frame. So I suspect that a lot of these have, there's a term in the federal government overcome by intervening events that a lot of the, the reserve judgments have been overcome by, by intervening events, meaning either the tenant has paid the amount that was originally due on that reserve judgment, or um, they are no longer in possession of the property. Uh, the, if you could switch to the final slide, number 13, or I guess 13 and 14, 13. Um, House Bill 18 required uh, the judiciary, and this is the first time that the judiciary has ever been required to create a form for individual, you know, not for the court's use, but for individuals outside of the court. And um, this particular form has gone through multiple revisions. We posted it publicly on our website and, and um, we, we sent it to the landlords and to the advocates to get comments on them. And thank you for all the people, probably some of you on this um, presentation today that that made comments to these and we were able to tweak them and we made changes as 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 recently as a week before October 1st but this is the final version I'm not promising that we won't have to make more revisions on this form but this is where it stands right now again we incorporated the QR code in there to try to drive business um, to the help centers we also up at the top we we tried to indicate is as best we could that rental assistance is available to both landlords and tenants um, and then the second page if you could go to 14 indicates all the nonprofit legal service organizations and thank you for for the, the um, for MLSC and others that contributed to creating this list on there and so as of October 1st and we've been getting a lot of calls I, I get a lot of calls at my office as you can imagine about what this notice is and all the the major landlords know about it. The the mom and pops. It's going to be an experiment on, but it is a condition. It's a condition precedent before judgment can be entered. We also changed our failure to pay rent form to include a checkbox that they're supposed to indicate that they provided the legal notice, and that there the, it is a item of proof at trial. That if they don't have that, um, if they don't, if they can't prove that they sent that notice, then then the judge um, will take that into account in determining whether they can grant or deny the the request for judgment. Um, 
That is, um, we also, as another matter, I've spoken to my, uh, during the pandemic, um, typically I, I have a committee that I chair that is the district court chief judges committee, and it's comprised of all 12 of my administrative judges. So we have 12 districts in the, in the district court, and each district has an administrative judge, an administrative clerk, and an administrative commissioner. Some of those districts only have like one county for like Baltimore City, for example, is district number one. It may have multiple courthouses within that district, but it's just one district. Other areas in the state, like the Lower Eastern Shore, which is District 3, have multiple counties in each district. There's four in, in the Lower Shore, um, and each one of those has its own courthouse. So there's only one courthouse in the county, but the district is comprised of four counties. Um, I started, typically that committee would meet quarterly. There were some other individuals too, elected individuals from throughout the court that, that contributed on that committee. But we started meeting with that committee. Um, it started out as three times a week to discuss all the issues that were going on. The circuit court was doing the same. And then the chair of the conference of the circuit court, as well as myself and the state court administrator would have a third meeting after that to try to coordinate our events, you know, not just for landlord tenant, but obviously for all operations in both the district and the circuit courts. And, and that was a level of communication that we had never enjoyed prior to the pandemic. And I think it's brought all of our courts and leadership much closer together. At some point, we started to back off on the three days a week, although that lasted for a considerable period of time and it was down to, to two times a week. And now it's once every other week. Um, at those sessions, we discuss all, it's where I provide the training to the administrative judges. We also have a joint conference between the, the Conference of Circuit Court Judges and my District Court Administrative Judges Committee, where we go over all pending legislation and we indicate all the, the, um, all the back office type of things. We have groups here in my district court headquarters whose job it is operationally to make sure that the legislation that's passed this last session or rule changes from Judge Wilner's group are incorporated into our business process, what we call um, QR, what are they called? Quick, quick reference guides, QRGs and training materials are created so that um, so that the courts know how to do it. And then another large part is that we um, have to work with our IT department to make sure that the computer programming changes are put into effect. Um, during some of these meetings, I have encouraged all of our courts um, and our administrative, not just the administrative judge, but the administrative clerks to take the warrants of restitution that are, are um, executed and, and they, they were instructed to reach out to their local governments and the money people in their local governments for distributing these rental assistance funds and work with them to get the warrants of restitution over to these people because we kind of identified that these individuals are probably at highest risk and that, that it would be a number that could be handled by the court in terms of the volume of getting that over. And I believe that almost all are, and if, it, if they're not, it's not, um, it's not because we haven't tried, it's because we haven't reached the, the organization yet, but all the big ones are. There's also, in all of our large jurisdictions, prior to the pandemic, there were two day of trial programs being operated in the state for landlord tenant. One was in Baltimore City, and one was in Prince George's County. Um, all of my other, the big five and six uh, counties, and that, that would include Prince George's, Baltimore City, Montgomery County, Anne Arundel County, and Baltimore County, they all have some version of that operating in their court, either um, in my hats off to legal aid because I was in Rockville not long ago and I went out just to watch the landlord tenant docket and I saw uh, an individual from legal aid and another attorney that was just volunteering there that day and they were handling all the people that came in that day and giving them advice. Um, and we have all the majors have that, even some of the mid-sized ones have that, Frederick County spinning one up as we speak. Um, and so we have pretty good coverage. It's either attorneys that are in there or the money people from the county that are in there. Um, and we've tried to accommodate them for space. One of the limiting factors that we have on all of these things, because I'm kind of anticipating where you're going when when the um, time comes to have um, the the attorneys there is is space, and that's always going to be a problem. If you've ever been to our Essex courthouse, um, you couldn't fit a toothpick in that courthouse more. We really have outgrown that courthouse. There's not a, a single foot of available space for any type of office or anything like that. We've got every 
every available space being used and even we're, we're over capacity in that court. Um, so when you hear me ask the, the state government and the powers that be for a new courthouse in Essex, I hope you all will support me for that. We're, we're building a new courthouse in Baltimore City um, to replace the civil courthouse down there, and it's, it's about seven blocks away. And one of the design elements that we're incorporating into that new courthouse will be a resource center. And that resource center, at least in my mind right now, um, and I've spoken to the architect and our engineers that are building out that property, um, that would be a room that would have um, multiple workstations that, that a person could have privacy in that would be connected to the service providers through either a dedicated link or something like that. And that's one area of coordination that we'll have to work out um, so that you may not have to be um, present physically in the building because even in the new courthouse, there's not enough space in the new courthouse. It's, it's a city courthouse. So I'm limited on how high and how big the building can be. Um, to, it, so it, it's kind of an idea that I'm hoping will catch on that we have these resource centers and that, you know, one office would be able to accommodate four or five individuals that come to court and then they would be hooked up with, you know, either the help center or these volunteer attorneys or the program that you're about to set up. And, and we would have that dedicated through technology um, in these little offices that we would set up inside the resource center. So with that said, I think I've covered um, most of the the where we believe the data is. I, I think the data is is showing that the money is hitting the individuals that are on there. It's really the only explanation I can come up with for why the numbers haven't gone out. I know that there's been many, many people that have been talking about a tsunami of, of eviction cases that have come and I've been pretty consistent saying that I, I have not and, and do not foresee a tsunami of evictions and there's a lot of reasons for that. The, the major one is that the money is flowing and it's getting to the people. If you think of $147 million um, that have already been distributed, and I think that's only the state money. I, I'm not so sure it's the individual because the, the top six, I think it was any county that had more than 200,000 people got their own money out of this chunk of the 400 million that was given originally. Um, so they have their own funding. And I know Prince George's for one example has done an outstanding job in giving out money. Um, they've given out millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, and the other, the other factor that I think is contributing to the lack of any tsunami coming is that we're still limited in the pace that we can operate in the court um, due to social distancing. So we can't set our dockets to 300 in the morning and 300 in the afternoon we can only set them you know we, we we've moved mostly most courts have moved to stagger docket so instead of doing one kind of cattle call at nine in the morning we do nine ten and eleven and then you know 1 30 2 30 3 30 um it's so that we can keep the group smaller and we can shuffle people in and out so we can still maintain social distancing the larger jurisdictions are behind prince george's is behind the most um, and then the city is probably behind after that. Rockville is behind, but not, I, I wouldn't call significantly. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to um, define what a backlog is, but for landlord tenants, a backlog in, in the court's opinion is um, when we're not setting cases in within that, that seven to 21 day window, and then how long out that we're setting those cases and that how long do we think that given the current capacity that we have that we can either resolve that backlog or quite frankly whether the back backlog will grow because we don't have the capacity right now to um to you know really fill our dockets completely like we used to be able to prior to the pandemic so we keep adjusting on those type of issues and experimenting and making sure that we're still abiding by social distancing and and frankly i don't I, I don't know when that will change um, right now. You know, I watch the numbers every single day um, and right now it seems like we're, we're um, plateaued on the, the most recent spike as the result of the Delta variant, um, but we're still running at about a thousand cases a day um, and that needs to change significantly. We're following the CDC um, agency and the Maryland Department of Health. They've been great through this whole thing and, and Dr. Mitchell particularly from the Department of Health has given us guidance every step of the way and, and how we're trying to maintain all the safety protocols that we have. Um, all of our courtrooms are, you know, it's still mask mask mandatory in all of our courthouses. 
Um, we still have the plexiglass up in all of our courthouses. We still require social distancing. You still have to answer a questionnaire before you come in. We have a um, Chief Judge Barbera prior to her, to her retirement um, issued an administrative order uh, mandating vaccinations for all employees of, of the court system or they have to be tested weekly if they're not vaccinated. And we instituted that policy about a month ago. Um, and so um, we're trying to protect everyone, not only our own people, but any individuals that come to court to give them the safest environment that we possibly can while still maintaining the need to provide justice to the citizens of Maryland. So with that, Professor, I'll stop talking. That was more talk than I need to talk for three weeks, um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. No, we no, appreciate it. it. That, that was a good uh, uh, summary, summary of all of the work you've been doing, and we really appreciate the court's efforts you know, to keep um, to keep justice on track and to, to work on this issue. We had uh, two questions that came up, and then we can open up potentially, because I don't see a lot of questions in the chat. One is, uh, comes from Luke Ponciano. Are you all finding that most failure to pay rent cases that reach court pursue a defense? And how about breach of lease, holdover, or wrongful detainer cases? So in, in failure to pay rent cases, not very many people show up. Um, in, during the pandemic, not many landlords showed up either. So we're sh showing much higher dismissal rates than what we would have seen prior to the pandemic. And, and the reason for that, again, is because normally we would have scheduled it between seven and 21 days, but say, you know, because of the pandemic, we might be scheduling it out 120 days. In all likelihood, that incident has already gone by. They've either paid their rent and are, you know, now that judgment's no longer effective or the court, even the, it's not even a judgment, even the fair to pay rent is no longer valid because they've already paid the rent. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, whole dockets, like if we schedule a 10 o'clock docket with 50 people, we're seeing sometimes whole dockets no one shows up for. Um, and in fact, when I was there in Rockville, I believe I only saw six individuals that showed up for the afternoon docket while I was there. Now, fortunately, you know, there were two attorneys to help those six individuals, so everyone got really good service. Trying to get people to come to court is, I, you know, I that's, a, that's an issue that's going to be with us forever. And um, I don't know how you get to that. Hopefully this notice provision will encourage more people either to resolve their disputes. I'm hoping that it'll result in um, less failure to pay rent filings because the people will have paid or done whatever they needed to do prior to the landlord actually filing the failure to pay rent case. It'll take some time for that to shake out. I think, like I said, I, I believe that the, well, I, I know from talking to some of the, the larger landlords and their trade groups that they're very aware of this 10 day notice and they'll get it on. I think there's gonna be a lot of dismissals as a result of mom and pop landlords. And there's a significant number of those um, that would have no idea that there's this 10 day notice. There, There's no way to really reach them to, to try to inform them that there's the law passed and that it was effective October 1st. They'll they'll kind of figure it out the hard way by having their cases dismissed because they didn't file it, and then they'll they'll learn that they need to put this notice in provision. But I'm I'm hopeful that that will assist in in reaching out to people and informing them of that. Um, and there there's a question about the notice, and that is about the burden. Is the burden on the landlord to prove that they provided the notice, or is it on the tenant to challenge? It, it is a, it, the, the landlord has to show the court that evidence that they did file. Now they, they can show it by electronic means. I, I think that was part of the negotiations that occurred in the legislature, not from my side, but from the landlord side, that they could um, bring, you know, digital evidence of the fact that they've done these things. And, and it's not unlike the licensure or, or that type of thing where they, they bring those licensures and, and show it to the court. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I'm going to open it up to our task force members to see if they want to unmute and ask Judge Morrissey direct questions. Let's not be shy. Oh, yes. Okay, I see a, a hand up. And it is uh, Senator Hedelman. Yes, please. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you just raised something that I, I'm just curious your thoughts on, um, Judge Morrissey. You mentioned um, that it is really difficult to reach some of the landlords uh, and that they wouldn't, for example, have 
a way to get notice about the 10 day notice. Is there in your mind, and I think this pandemic has shown that it is important for the court to be able to communicate with landlords, whether you have thoughts about how we could set up a system where you, the court and others could notify them during these kinds of emergencies. Well, I do. I, I send out my, you know, my communications, but I, I don't know who those landlords are or whether they're going to file or not. I would have no idea of that. And I, I would, I, I really, that's, that's outside the scope of what I believe the judiciary's function is. I, I think that would be an executive branch function that would do something like that. And whether that's the Department of Housing or the local providers, they, they would be better able to do something like that than the court. Okay, thanks. Uh, and I see Luke Montiano, go ahead, please unmute. Hi, uh, thank you, Judge. I really appreciated the presentation. Um, I was curious about uh, the role of continuances in the court. Um, like what are some typical reasons uh, given for continuances that are successful? And I, I guess I'd be curious if there are reasons given that were unsuccessful um, and how that impacts the court's work. Well, I, you know, continuances are, are granted for good cause shown. Um, that can be, that can run the gambit. I, I couldn't give you, you know, a common one. It could be anything. It could be the person's got COVID and they can't pass the the conditions that require entry into the courthouse. We would give them the option if that were the case to, to proceed remotely if they wanted to, but um, typically people don't wanna do that because they're sick, right? And they, they, we, would, we would reschedule on something like that. Um, but I, I've gotten a lot of, why don't you just require your judges to um, continue these cases for whatever, 21 days. Um, in, in as the chief judge of the district court, I have no greater power to instruct a judge on how to judge than they have to instruct me on how to judge. The, the judges judge based on the law and that requires good cause shown. I have spoken to my administrative judges. Um, we're very sensitive to the fact that this money was at, at times not getting out as quickly as I think everyone would have liked to have done. And that I can only tell you that if, um, again, there can be, you know, there can be many reasons for, for good cause, and there can be many reasons, even if the person may facially have good cause, that, that a request for continuance um, would be denied. If it was their fifth time telling the court that they've applied for rental assistance funding and they can't show any evidence of the fact that they've done that, I might be less inclined to grant a continuance than if uh, someone came in on the fifth time and showed me paperwork that indicated they had filed and they were doing everything they were supposed to. So it's situational, it's unique to each case, and it's decided on a judge by judge basis. We all are aware though, all the judges in the state are aware of the money that's being out there. And, and that's been communicated to them multiple times and we've had multiple discussions with my administrative judges. Okay, we have a question from Rena Shaw. Uh, thank you so much, Judge Morrissey, um, uh, for the presentation. Uh, I yesterday we had a presentation from other states that had implemented a right to counsel, or, or were in the process of implementing uh, a similar right in their states, and a lot of what they talked about was sort of data collection and uh, trying to see the effectiveness uh, of. Um, you know, the, the program uh, on both, you know, the case, t case filings, um, a case outcomes, et cetera. And so in terms of um, data that uh, the court collects, um, are there plans uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I think something that we'd want to look at is what other states are doing and then, you know, bring that to our state. And I just wanted to see if the, the judiciary already had plans uh, about data collection, public re release of data, et cetera? Well, we do publicly release all the data that we capture right now, and it's on our website and posted as soon as we get through it. It, it takes a little time to compile the data that we have because you have to remember, I have 33 different courthouses throughout the state, um, and everyone has to get that information centrally to my operations department, and then my operations department reviews it and then they ultimately send it to me and then I approve the release of the data. And that does take some time. I have encouraged the, the 
courts and, and ask them to prioritize landlord tenant data because I've known that this is a, a very hot topic for many, many people. And we're down to about a three week turnaround at the end of the month. Um, right now, the landlord tenant system is still entirely in paper. It's a paper driven function. Um, it is a case type that was exempt from MDEC. And the reason that it was exempt from MDEC is because it doesn't fit into the MDEC model. There, there was that five page form that actually works very efficiently for the court um, in terms of the, the different routes that that, that that paper has to go. Uh, we have been working with the vendor that, that is MDEC for us, and we, we are in the process of developing what we're calling a bulk filing solution that would allow um, you know, multiple landlord tenant filings to come into the court in a relatively short period of time. Um, we're in the testing phase of that right now. We still have to go through the validation stage before we can even launch a program. The, the anticipated um, how it's going to work is, is that we're going to pilot this in Baltimore County. There are several of the larger filers that are sophisticated enough that they can um, test for us. And, and so we will use them as our guinea pigs, if you would, and that we will um, hammer out the system in Baltimore County. And then once we've got it in Baltimore County to, to a point where we feel it's sufficient enough, we'll roll it out to all the um, MDEC counties, which is all but uh, Montgomery, Prince George's and Baltimore City right now. And we will incorporate it into our go live process for the remaining counties. Um, so that's the plan. I can't give you an exact trial date on it. We've, we have had um, some frustrations, partly the pandemic. We couldn't really meet to do the testing that we needed to do it. Partly the vendor hasn't supplied us with a with code yet that we could test end to end. When we get that system in place, our, our ability to capture data will be much greater. One of the benefits of MDEC is we can create custom reports to tailor to what we want to do with the data fields. But right now in the paper world, um, it is it is next to impossible to capture some of the data that, that I know that has gone through the legislature before and been requested and we fought because it's just not it's not a possible. And, and I I just have an ask to people that, you know, if, if they're going to the legislature and asking for data elements and I'll just give you one example, like the census track. That has no business purpose to the court at all whatsoever, and it's not an item that we track anywhere in the state. We don't know how we would do that. It would cost a lot of money to get custom programming for us to develop a system like that. So it, it I just ask that it, it kind of needs to be tailored to why and how we do our business and what data elements we would naturally capture as the result of the filing that comes in, because they're they're boxes, right? If you it, it, a data element would be a name of the of the tenant, right? And that's in a certain box in the in the form, and we can capture that in the MDEC system and do that. But in order to create data elements that we would not normally capture, and there's no reason for us to capture, would require a lot of time and a lot of money. And I just ask that you keep that in mind if you're making requests for data. Thank you. Uh, all right, Deb Seltzer. Thank you. Good morning, Chief Judge Morrissey. Good morning. Um, question about it, something I was thinking of a few things you mentioned. One, we know that it's very difficult to get people to actually go to court. You spoke about in the new courthouse kind of these um, help centers that that might allow people to remote in. And then again, the possible uh, possibility of proceeding remotely, for example, if someone has COVID. Do you think going forward, I know remote work is not, you know, appropriate for every single case type. Do you see that as a possibility? I'm just thinking about as folks are looking to implement this program, how we might be able to connect, you know, tenants and attorneys remotely. Um, do you think that's something the court is going to consider continuing on into the future? Um, and would that be applicable in rent court? Sure. So um, we have a new chief judge, Chief Judge Getty. Um, and Chief Judge Getty has put together a work group that's chaired by the Chief Judge of the Court of Special Appeals, Matthew Fader. Um, and I'm on that work group. And its design of that work group is to look at um, what things worked during the pandemic, what changes we made that could be institutionalized, and, and what balance we reach on issues, just like you said. So 
I can't tell you right now, but the turnaround is relatively quick. We're, we're expecting something in, in months rather than years. Um, and we will try to hash out all those issues and, and we will invite individuals like your, yourself and others to make comments on what they think should happen on it so that we can institutionalize it. There are, I, I think everyone on this phone call would agree, there are pluses and minuses of, of remote proceedings. Um, there's the digital divide that's a big issue that I'm very sensitive to that, that individuals may not have um, access or, or really bandwidth is one of the big issues, right? They may not have internet that, that allows them to video in. And um, if you've done a proceeding where it's entirely by phone, it is not in my mind exactly where I would like due process to be and, and justice to be delivered. It's, it's not a, a, a very good product in my opinion. Was it necessary during the pandemic at times? Absolutely, and, and I'm proud that we were able to incorporate that in. Um, but we'll, we'll see this committee will will our work group rather will come up, you know, we'll discuss all those issues. We'll take input from the public and try to come up with a balance. I, I can tell you that um, I, and I've been to a number of seminars the, the National Center for State Courts is a real resource for all of the state court systems and they put on series of, of um, they call them tinies and they, they have these webinars and seminars and things and, and I do join those. I, I just joined one last week about almost this exact issue and, and there was a chief judge from New Mexico and, and a judge from Arizona and the striking part about all these is that I don't learn a whole lot from them because we're all dealing with the exact same issues you know what I mean we're trying to find that that sweet spot that that we can incorporate there, there certainly will be things that we incorporate um, video technology in there's no question about that and I'll give you one example is that um, in February of 2020, I had a meeting with the Secretary of Health about telemedicine for, men, for, for people that are suffering from any type of mental health issue, and in particular, incompetence to stand trial. And we talked about developing a pilot that would go out six months from there in one county, you know, we'd see how it went and capture everything that we need to capture and determine whether this was something we were all on board in. A, a month later, we had it distributed to every single county in the state. And, you know, we, we took a leap and it, as it turned out, it's been an exceptional program because what we we were a little afraid that perhaps individuals that are suffering from mental health issues would be um, afraid to, to be on TV and that type of thing and have phobias about that. And it's turned out to be just the opposite, that they no longer have to be transported to court for um, and all the disruption that comes along with that and, and, you know, showing up in a strange building where they've never been before and seeing a judge in a robe up on top of a bench and having security officials around them. Instead, now they can they can broadcast from their, you know, from wherever they're being held at the time at the, at the hospital and with people that they're familiar with. And it's just worked out uh, as best as you could possibly imagine. And, and things like that is that's kind of a no brainer for us. We'll, we will keep that moving forward. Um, but everything else, you know, we're looking at those issues and trying to figure it out and, and we will um, take public input and we'll, we'll come up with a product that we hope that everybody agrees with. All right, Judge Morrissey, another question about um, how uh, the court is preparing to implement access to counsel. I, I know that it's it's a new, is there a working group assigned to look at that and how that will work? Are you coordinating with the help centers, with um, the access to justice department? I'm just wondering how that those plans are underway. Well, you know, attorneys come to court every day on all sorts of cases. I, I don't sure. I don't see this as anything outside the ordinary of what we would already deal with. I, I mean, I, speaking for myself, and I think I could speak for the majority of judges, I would much prefer doing a hearing with attorneys on both sides than doing self-represented. It, it, it is much, it, there are better arguments made. I, all, all the reasons that you all know about why we would want an attorney in our court to, to, to argue the case on their behalf. Um, the, the only thing that that is that that will require some coordination is again space going back to space where are these people going to be where can they meet with their clients you know in a private area so that they can talk to them and um it, it's going to be a, that's going to be a challenge in some places it's going to be easy you know the catonsville courthouse is spacious and it's built for the 21st century and there's multiple meeting rooms that can be used and um but again, I, I go back to like Essex and some of our older courthouses where 
if if I could fit something else in those courthouses, I've already fit it in, and there's there's no available space at all for anyone to to do anything with. So we'll have to figure it out, but it works right now. I re, you know, people meet all the time. Their attorneys meet their clients at the courthouse or they go outside or they, you know, they find a cubby hole where they can talk or do something. Um, so that's going to be the challenge. And that's, you know, that's why I'm, I'm looking at these resource kind of rooms where, um, you know, an individual can be hooked up to you all, uh, to the, to the providers, you know, to get advice there and, and, um, without having, you know, six different providers trying to get off the space in the courthouse. Cause that's just, that just can't happen. I, there's not enough space in any of our courthouses to provide that type of access. Okay. And just as a follow up on that was about training, are judges getting in any training about rental assistance resources that they can announce from the bench or doing something similar? Is that part of the protocols currently to connect folks up? Well, that, that's part of what I was discussing before by meeting mm -hmm. with my administrative judges on a every two week basis. Those are topics. And I can tell you that that particular topic about resources has been discussed at least 10 times, maybe more. And in the way it works then is that they then, um, take that they have bench meetings once a month with their with their judges or more frequently if, if it's you know if it's something that I really need them to communicate to their bench I will tell them that in these meetings and say please you know communicate this out to everybody and you know I may supply them with the information that they need to communicate but it, it's part of the management of the court and that's the way that we operate is is that the 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 administrative judge is on the ground. They know their court system better than I know their court system. And they know how, you know, I may have the broad overriding, you know, this is this 10 day, I created the, my office created the form. Here's the form. You guys need to make sure all the judges know about the form and you need to make sure that, that it's being implemented. And, and that's worked very well for us over time. That's been the way it's been for the last eight years. And um, it's a very good system that we have. So. It, it's you know we have for all the clerks we have again an operations department whose sole job is to we, we start with the premise in my headquarters of what can the district court headquarters do for you that's the whole underlying basis of what we do and so the operations department at district court headquarters lends support to the clerks it gets them trained and gets them these quick reference guides so that even after the training they have a resource to look to um and they have all sorts of meetings among themselves and in in trainings with their clerks and um we have a pretty formal process of doing that for all legislative legislative that's come in we have a meeting um we track every piece of legislation two different groups track it through the judiciary one in my department um is their sole reason for tracking the legislation is to see what it will what forms it will affect and what programming changes we'll need and we have a meeting in june after the time that the governor can either veto or, or let the bills come in um, without signature and we get the subject matter experts from all across the state to look at each bill and then advise as to what changes should be made to the forms it then goes through the forms committee to actually create the form or modify the form and then it ultimately comes to me if it's a district court form or for the chair of the circuit court for joint forms the, the circuit courts don't use as many forms as the district court does but there are they're they're starting to see the light and coming in the direction of the district court so there's more and more circuit court forms and we even in the district court we have a circuit court analyst um, just for circuit court forms um, and then we we try to target a July 1st date for any type of you know programming change to make sure we're up and then the training occurs between July 1 and um, in October 1 for the majority of the bills um, every once in a while there's an emergency bill that we need to go outside to try to get that um, taken care of quicker and, and we try to do that as best we can. Great um, are there other questions? From the task force members, I see Luke again. Mm -hmm. Luke, sorry for being annoying. <laughs> no, that's um, not annoying. No, no, no. This is your time to ask questions. You're absolutely sure. welcome to do so. Um, so, uh, Judge, you'd mentioned uh, going to Rockville recently and sort of seeing landlord tenant court in action there, um, and that there were two attorneys that were there, kind of advising the, uh, I think it was six clients um, that showed up that uh, for that docket. Um, how, how do you view the value of sort of same day um, uh, counsel in, in that regard? Um, is it uh, sufficient for many of the cases? Um, is a different process uh, worth considering as we look into 
implementation work? It, you know, the, the issue before the court, the way that the legislature set up the overriding structure of the landlord tenant court is that because it's a summary proceeding, the, the, the issues are, are pretty narrow. I mean, it really is, it's limited to has the tenant paid the rent or not? There can be other issues that are raised, obviously, by the tenant that the, the conditions of the property are faulty. Um, and, and there's a business model for that in court. If someone raises that, um, we then open a, again, I keep referring to it as blue file, they're blue. Um, I then create a rent escrow in court, you know, and rent escrow can be an affirmative or, or affirmative defense or a defense raised in open court. And so I'll create that blue file. I'll, I'll, I will order the inspectors to go out and inspect the property, and then I will tie the failure to pay rent case to the rent escrow case and reset that in typically within 21 days, sometimes longer, further out. It, it really depends on the inspectors, and, and it's kind of a localized function. Again, each when I was sitting in Prince George's County regularly, I, under, I knew because I dealt with the inspectors all the time as to how much time they needed. And so I would set it out after that, and then we would have the the hearing on both cases when it came back in. Um, it, it, I don't think there's another way to do it rather than to have it there. There, there you know, obviously there's a number of, of situations that could require you to, to require more information and that's just gonna be handled again for good cause shown on a case by case basis if additional time is needed. But I, the, the majority of the cases that I see of people coming to court is they wanna work out a payment plan with their landlord that's one or two, they dispute the amount of rent that's due. They're saying that, you know, they, they paid or they, um, they don't, they shouldn't have been charged the, the late fee or, and those are the issues that typically go to trial on the court, either a blue file or that type of issue. Um, and so, you know, the, it's it's very similar to way that the public defenders operate on bail review. They they interview their their clients in the morning and you know or even ten minutes before the hearing, and they come in and do the hearing because it's somewhat of a summary proceeding. We have a question about um, about the uh, an access point for access to counsel. What's your view about the help centers being a central access point? For intake when the access to counsel uh, program is is implemented. I'm not sure I understand what that would what that would entail, Professor. Well, I think the idea is that um, people are learning to come to the help center. They're set up already. And is that a way to use those um, centers as a possible intake um, point for the access to counsel program? They, they certainly, I think it already operates that way in a certain respect. Um, it, it, I, I have referred individuals to the self-help center hundreds of times um, to say, go, go outside right around the corner, go talk to those attorneys and then come back in here and, and tell me what you want to tell me at that point. Um, and also the clerk's office does a lot of that too. The clerk's office will, will be able to, you know, if there are, I, I don't know how the vision that you all have as to how individuals are, you know, uh, how counsel is going to appear in court, but certainly, you know, if, if people call in or they walk in, there are handoffs and Pam, oh, you can probably speak to that too, because you know the workings, but there's also an active participation and collaboration between our ADR department and um, the self-help centers or the help centers. Um, they refer cases back and forth to each other a lot. Sure, I'd be interested, Pam. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to support what Judge, Chief Judge Morrissey is saying. The help um, with Judge Morrissey's leadership, we've um, added an intake or referral unit with the um, Maryland Center for Legal Assistance, our vendor, the subsidiary of Legal Aid. And that unit is um, working directly with the attorneys. Once the attorneys have finished talking with folks, they're, they're routing people to the referral unit in the call center, in the help center. And then they are making, um, we're really doing this as a partnership with civil justice and their Maryland Justice Passport Project. And this is a project that is designed to create a client-owned sort of digital portfolio so that 
um, information can be transmitted to referral resources very quickly with the client's permission. So we can talk more about that, and a lot of you know about that project. But I do think, Judge, um, as Judge Morsey noted, the help centers are, are set up, uh, in fact, to do a, exactly that. Okay, Arena Shaw, you had your hand up. Yes, Chief Judge Marcy, I wanted to follow up again on the data question that I asked. Um, oh, over the last year, um, since the Access to Justice Commission partnered with the Attorney General and the COVID-19 Access to Justice Task Force, one of the areas that we've really um, you know, been looking at is, is sort of civil justice data uh, broadly. And we've tried to develop tools to sort of make that data more accessible, make it, um, you know, kind of comparable across counties, et cetera, so that we could use it for better outreach, um, et cetera. Um, one of, a few of the things that you said in your original response in terms of what data might already be available to you, there were some gaps that we had noted in terms of, you know, trying to keep up with data real time so that we could be responding um, in terms of need. And I think it's very applicable to the access to council implementation. Um, some of the data points, um, that in terms of, uh, we have a data committee that's headed by Matt Steubenberg, um, who's been trying to look at data that we can sort of um, get from the publicly available data. And some of the gaps uh, appear to be in case outcomes um, for failure to pay rent, um, whether knowing whether an eviction has actually occurred, even if the disposition was for an order, um, is hard to get an accurate count of of the number of evictions from the data that's available from the courts, um, and then also uh, cases that may happen by zip code, and that are uh, you know that are open. Um, it seems that the what is on uh, case search is is cases that are already closed. Um, so I just wanted to raise that in terms of things that I think when we think about implementation of access to counsel, those sort of data points might be actually uh, very helpful, but we were noticing that there were gaps in those data right now. Well, I'm very painfully aware of the fact, as I mentioned before, we're still in paper and I don't want to be in paper. I want it to all be in MDEC and when we get the capability in MDEC, um, we will do that. The reason why cases appear in case search right now is because I made a decision in, in um, August of 2014 when we went live in, in Anne Arundel County. I knew that we didn't have electronic filing of landlord tenant cases, but I wanted to back scan those into the system after disposition so that we would have an electronic record because we're trying to maintain everything electronically. So we would have a database that all started at the same time in August of 2014. That requires the difference between backscanning, and it's why there's two parts to the MDEC system. There's the case management system that we call Odyssey, and that's what the clerks use to enter data into the, you know, they enter events and they they attach documents to those events and, and they document the case through there. Um, the other part is file and serve, and that's what you all as attorneys use to enter into the system. And those for security reasons, you can't file directly into the to the database you you no one would ever do that and you, you have to develop a system not so so there's a basically a firewall between file and serve and, and odyssey and um when you electronically scan those in and we accept them into the case management system all the fields are already populated because it's there and we don't have to back scan everything so my clerks have been doing a tremendous job, but we knew that when we got to Baltimore County that it would overwhelm us by trying to scan everything in. And so some counties are, are pretty good about, you know, within a week after disposition, they back scan these things in. Um, and some counties are, are very far behind and the pandemic exacerbated that condition. If you remember in the beginning, we were working in teams, only a third of our clerks were in the office and quite frankly we were as Gloria Gaynor's famous line is we were just trying to survive um, and we're getting back to you know where we were before but there, there's still backlogs in all sorts obviously criminal case backlogs are the ones that keep me awake at night and trying to make sure that we're um, not you know we focused on anyone that's incarcerated first as, as a primary matter before that um, but we've also, you know, tried to do it for all other case types too. Um, so 
th that's why there's some information in case search, but I've always maintained that it's not current and it's not real time and it can't be real time that we don't have the staffing or functional capability to do that. And that's why I need this bulk filing solution to come in so that we can capture that. And when we get that, our data capability will be greatly enhanced. Um, we will be able to run reports, you know, even on a daily basis, that kind of thing. Um, but we just can't do that right now. Thank you, Judge. And is there is a timeline for implementation for that system for the or if we, if we can get the code yet. to work correctly, um, I'm hoping that it'll be um, sometime in the next year. Okay. We Thank still you. haven't and been I able see. to. We still haven't been able to successfully, you know, run the program from start to finish on a case. That's when I mentioned um, solution validation. That's what I meant. And and it's to give my IT department. They're they're very particular, obviously for obvious reasons. And you know, code. If you've ever been involved in any type of software project. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like a contractor that works on your house. If you ever had a contractor that comes out and they get 95% done and it's that last 5%, they didn't paint the trim or they forgot to hook up. The, we just, I just had a, um, a dryer installed in my house and they didn't hook up the little vent in the back. And I'm hoping that I did it correctly. Um, but it's that kind of thing with software code where it comes in and it may be, you know, 90% good, but we have show stoppers and high degree, high priority, medium priority and low priority issues that we need to resolve and even before we could do the testing part of it and that's the stage we're in right now and then system validation would be you know running hundreds or thousands of these things through and making sure that our business process works with the code in, in the way that it's supposed to work um, and then we'll do that pilot in baltimore county so there's a number of steps that have to go we're still in the testing stage and i'd like to be able to give you a date but i can't quite right now Okay, we. I see Pam Ortiz's hand up is up. I'm not sure if that's legacy. Uh, Pam. That was before, yeah. That was from before. Okay, all right. Just wanted to make sure. Um, we heard, as as you know, I think Rita mentioned, we had a number of presentations from other jurisdictions, and there were. Um, uh, it was interesting when they talked about the implementation. They talked about culture change, which was really interesting because you know, uh, generally, especially for. Uh, legal assistance for low-income Marylanders and Rencord has been uh, operating on a scarcity model. You know, if folks were lucky enough to get counsel and it sort of flips with a program like this or can. So that's one thing. But there's a also a number of the programs we spoke with yesterday have eviction diversion programs in addition to their um, right to counsel or access to counsel programs. Have uh, the Maryland courts considered anything like that? Well, that's, I mean, we're doing it right now. In in the, mm -hmm. the larger jurisdictions, as I mentioned before, we have either attorneys in the courtroom at the courthouse or the money people that are in the courthouse. We don't, I don't like the term diversion. Um, remember, I have to be neutral as to everyone. I have to be neutral to landlords and I have to be neutral toward tenants. And if you've looked at what I've tried to accomplish, the the help center is a good example. Landlords can use the help center. Tenants can use the help center. I hope everybody uses the help center. That's the whole goal of the help center is that anyone coming to court can use this. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea of diverting is is not a term that I like, but I can tell you that we're doing it right now in all of our major counties, most of our mid-sized counties. The, the smaller counties have been tasked to make contact with their own you know, money people there in the county and, and whatever resources they have available. The, the smaller counties just don't have the resources typically to do that, you know, whether it's, you know, they don't have a legal aid presence there or other providers there that can have someone sit in a court every day, but they're all aware of it and they're all um, kind of proud of the work that we've done. In Baltimore City, they, they have the functional equivalent of a rent diversion program and we work closely with public justice and others to, to accomplish that. Thank you. All right. Other questions? All right. Just doing the last. I don't see anything else in the chat at this time. Uh, do we have any other questions um, from the task force? We don't want to belabor or spend time that we don't need. Just as closing, um, right. Professor. Uh, you know, I've already worked, we've already had multiple conversations with Deb um, about the pamphlet that's supposed to come in in House Bill um, 18. 
and we'll continue to work through all these issues you do. We'll figure out a made, way to make it work. It, it I, I don't view it as insurmountable in any way, and I'm, look, I'm looking forward to it. I think you're on mute, well, Professor. I think, yeah, what I was going to say is, you know, we we agree this is a partnership. Our job is to really uh, dig in and um, look at how implementation is going and funding needs for the program and then to uh, continue to assess it and make recommendations. And we certainly understand there's a partnership. There are needs that the judiciary will have to implement this program. And we look forward to working with you on those going Good. forward. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate it. We've got some sessions next week. Um, we're, we're kind of in a vigorous uh, schedule of information gathering and fact finding. So we appreciate it. It was essential to talk to you. I imagine we'll be chatting. Uh, we have some committees who will be working on these specific recommendations, and we may circle back to some of your colleagues, you know, just to make sure that we've uh, heard what we need to hear from you and and uh, we we can um, collaborate more closely. Thank Certainly. you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your being here and uh, we'll see you next week. Have a great three day weekend. <laughs> OK, take care. all right. Take care.